That's okay. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to Katie, um, Sarah, Darren, and colleagues for inviting me to come and speak here today. Um, it's not actually thank you. It's not actually that often I get let out of Wales, so it's really lovely to be here. Um, I'm a terrible waver whilst presenting, so I will try my best with the microphone. But I do apologise if I'm getting louder and quieter ferociously. Um, so briefly, what I'm going to talk about, I want to cover. Um, this idea of ACE inquiry, so describe to you what it means to me essentially as a frame to all of the stuff that I'll then talk about. Um, I'm going to describe really briefly some of the evidence around this and some of the ongoing debates that exist within both academic literature and kind of among practitioners. Um, I'll then describe in detail some of the pilot studies that um, Public Health Wales were asked to evaluate and I'll set the scene with those studies and then hand over to my colleague Kerry to provide more of a focus and a spotlight on actually what it was like to deliver that within health visiting in practice um, and then I'll come back and try and pull together learning from that pilot and the other pilots that I'll reference to give a more general picture of some of the outcomes of um, looking at the feasibility and acceptability of ACE inquiry. Uh, obviously I'll finish with some recommendations both for implementation and for further research and I'm delighted that then at the end of that we've got you know time for us to hear from you really and have a discussion about perhaps some of your intentions and ambitions around taking this type of work forward. Um, so in terms of what we mean by this concept of routine or ACE inquiry, um, so it's a it's something that I'm sure you're all probably familiar with to a greater or lesser extent. It's a universal public health approach um, that's really about asking everyone um, certain types of questions alongside the standard other questions that we would ask them, alongside the way that we would normally take history from individuals. So in terms of that process, it's fundamentally nothing different from the types of things that we already do in terms of understanding history, but it provides a certain way to ask directly a series of questions about these experiences. Um, the idea is that it's a proactive approach, so we don't wait to be told. Um, to the best of what we know, waiting to be told just simply doesn't work. Um, so we're asking, and by asking, and asking everybody, we're creating this culture, if you like, that yes, these problems are um, you know, quite prevalent in society, yes, they have serious impacts, but it's okay to talk about them. And as health practitioners or practitioners in other fields, we want to know and understand about this um, to improve our understanding of the individual and deliver the best kind of person-centered care that we can. Um, the idea is that it's not deterministic, and I can't really underline this enough. So in screening, we would essentially say, you have X, therefore we'll give you Y, because we know that Y works for X. Um, whereas in an approach like this, you might identify that you have X, but actually what we're then going to do is allow you to talk about everything that you've experienced from A to Z, so that we can develop an understanding of your individual need. And actually what we do with that understanding is not necessarily put you on a different pathway, but use that understanding to use existing provisions that we have to support you in a way that's more effective and takes account of the whole person um, and all of their kind of holistic needs. Um, back in 2004, I think it was, was um, one of the times that um, Felitti um, from the US started asking about ACEs in kind of alongside standardised assessments in clinic. Um, and his idea was that this had an inherent therapeutic benefit. So people felt better simply from having the opportunity to discuss this with a trusted health professional. And from there, this idea has really grown. Um, just kind of a caveat from my perspective is that I know a lot of people will refer to this as routine ACE inquiry or routine inquiry. Um, largely throughout this, I will say ACE inquiry. Um, for one reason only really, and that is the pilots that I've been involved in evaluating typically haven't delivered ACEs or ACE inquiry routinely. So they might not have delivered it to, to everybody for reasons of either design or challenges in delivery. Um, and for that reason alone, typically I'll refer to it as ACE inquiry. Um, but just to be clear, it essentially means the same thing as the concept that you're all familiar with. Um, so as Katie referenced, I worked um, on some uh, a study with... Um, colleagues from Bangor University, so Dr. Kat Ford that I know has met lots of you or corresponded with you previously um, on this scope and review paper that was out this week in Child Abuse and Neglect. And essentially what that does is summarise the state of the global evidence base um, for this concept of routine ACE inquiry. I will see from this, um, I've just projected it onto a map at the side for you, that there are very few studies and actually the one study that remained in the scope and review that came from the UK um, was one that actually asked about practitioner attitudes towards this idea of asking about child sexual abuse and experiences of domestic violence. 
Um, so overall, there are very few small-scale small scale studies, um, largely from the US. Of those 11 US studies, within that, we find the six that actually piloted an approach. So most of the studies actually describe practitioners' views as to how they would feel about delivering it. Um, those six were small-scale pilots that actually looked at implementation. But for the most part, there was a really limited examination of any outcomes or impacts, um, either on service users or their health, behaviour, wellbeing, etc. Um, so what remains is a really large question mark over this. There's a clear gap in the evidence. And obviously, most of our pilot studies come from a, a completely different health system. So question marks then about how we might transfer that evidence to a UK or other state-supported health system. Um, and the debate goes on. Um, so this tail end of last year in uh, child abuse and neglect, there were two discussion papers um, that came from some well thought of academics in this area. Um, so we have Finkel Hall that essentially described um, caution around the fact that he felt that the implementation of ACE inquiry had been driven beyond um, the pace at which evidence was generated of its harms and impacts, um, and suggested that we didn't yet have an understanding of effective measures to support people that are identified with ACEs. Um, so that was his primary concern. Alongside that, we had comments from another academic, Jube, who actually was taking the alternative view that we can't continue to put this in the too hard to do box. ACEs is a public health crisis of our time, and we need to find a way to do something um, to consider a more holistic approach and an emic perspective for patient care. Um, and obviously, two sides of the spectrum there with regards to ACE inquiry. Um, what Jube did do is call for more evidence around the feasibility and acceptability, both from qualitative and quantitative studies. Alongside this, we see lots of concerns from practitioners. Um, the things that come up here are many things that you might have heard if you're perhaps service managers looking at this, or they might be things that you actually feel yourself. And what I can say in the work that I've been involved with is that these are very real concerns that appear from people and are things that have to be challenged in um, kind of readiness assessments and training um, because they are, as we'll see in some of the later evidence, um, present real barriers to people for engaging in this work. So the initiatives I'm going to talk about are um, both in England and in Wales, and I just want to be really clear from the outset that Public Health Wales, um, who I work for, were not involved in the design or delivery of these approaches. Actually, what we were commissioned to do was to provide an independent evaluation of these. Um, so we weren't responsible for implementation, but came in to look at some of the, the impacts of these projects. Uh, the first of which was um, a project called REACH, uh, Routine Crime to Adversity in Childhood, which took place um, in Lancashire, um, in northwest England, and was part of a wider piece of work that was funded by NHS England to look at this idea of asking about ACEs. Um, there's a model there that's um, described around the REACH approach, which essentially moves through organisational readiness and supporting um, organisations in change management, to an ongo ongoing series of support that helps them move towards um, finding a way to provide practitioners with the skills and confidence to ask about ACEs and then sensitively and appropriately respond to disclosures. Um, so what this um, pilot study did was then provide an independent evaluation of that approach uh, within one uh, general practice. Um, and that was um, a general practice that was um, a large multi-site practice, um, so it was delivered over three sites. Um, for this practice, and it was a busy training practice that operated a telephone triage um, talk and treat system. Um, to have frozen. There we go. Um, so, yeah, as I said, it was a large practice, and those clinicians that were involved in delivering ACE inquiry, uh, there were three GPs, uh, nurse practitioners, and a healthcare assistant, all of whom took part in this process. Um, perhaps a typical profile that we might see of a general practice in that area. Um, but one of the important things that I wanted to highlight, you can see that, but um, of the number of ACE inquiries that were completed, so 218, in that time period there were only 16 people that said that they didn't want to take part. So we see quite a staggering uptake rate of over 93% of people that were happy to complete the ACE questions in their general practice. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looked like after. Um, so just to give you a really brief flavour of that sample, um, I just thought I'd share um, some of the ACE prevalence data, which, if you recall, is actually marginally higher, um, although not a lot, from the national prevalence studies that identify level of ACEs in England, um, and maybe what we might expect from a population that we understand are probably currently unwell um, to visiting their general practitioner. 
but we see some of the same relationships, typically a bit more pronounced, but the relationships with adverse outcomes, um, so health and mental health and wellbeing outcomes, they're more likely among those individuals with a high number of ACEs. Um, across the border now into Wales, so um, from 2015 when the first national ACE study um, was conducted in Wales, we've had a, a movement towards, um, away from simply understanding and describing the problem, to thinking about how we act in prevention and early intervention, how we build resilience, and how we can respond in different services and settings to mitigate some of the impacts of ACEs. Um, in Wales, this is kind of aligned and reflected in some policy and strategy, so most recently our new health and social care plan, um, and aligns well with some of the other objectives around um, sort of supporting attachment within Healthy Child Wales programme. Um, because of this interest and this kind of wider agenda, um, the health boards within Wales um, were keen to sort of action this in some way. And particularly, um, Betsy Cadwallader Health Board in North Wales um, looked at this idea of ACE inquiry. Um, so they took that as one of their objectives to look at that in different settings. Um, ACE inquiry in North Wales, um, in both of the pilots that we'll describe, so GP and health visiting, um, was delivered um, as a model by an independent consultant facilitator. And the approach that was taken there is, is kind of there on the left for you, explain, ask, listen and close. Um, and this individual supported um, the services in providing training and ongoing tools and provisions to help the services to deliver these approaches. Um, so the GP pilot in Wales was across um, three different practices. Um, I think a, a variety of areas there that we'll describe across Anglesey. Um, so in particular, obviously different sizes, but different levels of deprivation. Um, based on the location of the primary site of the practice, practice D is in um, the 10 to 20% most deprived uh, based on um, WIMD scores. Um, but again, quite a similar profile to the Lancashire pilot in terms of people's healthcare need and levels of chronic conditions. And a really similar story with regards to the overall uptake. Um, just to share a couple of kind of findings in terms of the patient data for that practice. Um, we see, again, similar patterns that we might expect from general population samples around the um, relationship between ACEs and outcomes. Um, and quite interesting for me is the level of referral into secondary care for those that have a high number of ACEs. So quite staggering differences we see there, particularly in the um, sort of middle age categories. So what was the process? So across, um, what I've tried to do here is summarise the similarities of the approach that was taken in Lancashire through the REACH model and the approach that was taken in GPs in North Wales. Um, and in the best that I can, this process, this patient pathway describes how those two pilots were delivered. Uh, so essentially someone arrives at um, their surgery for a, a pre-booked face-to-face -face appointment. Um, it's up to the reception team in both cases to decide whether they're eligible to take part in ACE inquiry. Um, so each practice had individual criteria that they selected for individuals to take part. Um, it'd be too much for me to describe them all, but some of them were related to use of language, potentially. Um, there were particular practices in North Wales that decided it wasn't appropriate to ask those that they had identified as extremely frail. Um, so a range of different criteria that it was down to the reception teams to identify whether patients met those criteria. Um, then, in both pilots, they were given some kind of information about the ACE inquiry process. So... Patients were given a pack by the reception team that included a sheet that described why the practice was doing it and what the process was. And then they had sight of the ACE question there before they decided whether or not they wanted to take part. Obviously, if they declined, the practice recorded the number of people that declined. Um, we don't have any more information on those patients. It wasn't retained, but we do have, a, obviously, a record of how many people it was. Um, and then those that wanted to take part completed the ACE questionnaire sort of alone in private but sat within the waiting area before they attended their appointment. Um, the instruction to them was to then take that completed questionnaire and hand it to the clinician at the beginning of their appointment. Um, for the most part, the model was that the, um, gen the GP or the nurse practitioner um, wanted to first deal with the presenting issue and then reflect on the ACE questionnaires. Um, in reality, it often wasn't this model. Um, they described typically because patients that were primed by thinking about the ACE questionnaire often came in wanting to talk about that first. And in those cases, the clinician would allow the conversation to take that turn, although admittedly some felt quite uncomfortable that that wasn't the process that they wanted to deliver. 
Um, but at some point through that consultation, both their presenting issue and this ACEs discussion would take place. Um, patients might not have identified any ACEs, but in which case the practitioner would still typically talk to that patient about what ACEs meant and why this activity was taking place to understand them in greater detail. Or the patient might choose not to talk about their ACEs, or if they wanted to talk about, there was an opportunity to then discuss with the health practitioner um, some of the potential impacts of that experience on their longer term health and wellbeing outcomes as an adult. Um, and I suppose what's really interesting is that I think what initially started as discussions around some of the negative impacts, um, practitioners quickly became aware that it was also important to talk about how that may have impacted individuals positively. So reframing the discussion around how that patient thought it might have led them to build greater resilience or greater understanding of other people that may be in a similar situation. Regardless of whether the patient had disclosed ACEs or wanted to talk about them, all patients were given um, the same reassurance that they could revisit this conversation at any time and given information in the form of a leaflet in terms of local and national support services that they could then access or use and um, that didn't require referral through the GP but you know, they could access um, through other sources. Um, just then to kind of complete the full suite of pilots that um, we can reflect on here, um, I'll introduce the health visits pilot to you. Um, so this again took place in Anglesey, um, driven by the health board there, um, supported by the local authority. Um, and the distinction to make here is that um, a slightly different model was used in that um, the ACE group, as we refer to it, were individuals that completed the ACE inquiry at their routine six-week appointment with the health visitor. Um, so those individuals completed the questions and had a similar discussion, and Kerry will talk more about that process. Um, and then they were followed up at six months at their six-month appointment and asked a range of outcome measures around parental stress, health and wellbeing, etc. Um, as a comparison group, there was a group of individuals who weren't asked about ACEs at six weeks, but were asked at six months. So at six months, they received both the ACE inquiry and the outcomes questionnaire. I suppose the, the premise being that this allowed us to consider whether there had been any change in some of the outcomes or the relationship for those that had it early um, compared to those that didn't have that discussion until their six-month appointment. Um, and much like the picture in the other GP pilots, here we see a really similar high level of uptake uh, within health visiting. Worth noting um, that based on the differences in this model, there were times when health visits felt it wasn't appropriate to ask mothers to complete the information. And that typically was associated with some of the challenges of delivering this in a home setting and ensuring um, privacy to have that conversation. Although bearing in mind the size of the sample, this was a relatively infrequent occurrence. Um, and again, just to look at, kind of to understand this sample a little bit more, um, the ACE prevalence that we saw among mothers in the health visiting pilot um, is slightly less than we'd expect from the equivalent reproductive age women from the Welsh national sample. Um, but again, we see some of the common patterns of association between ACEs and, and outcomes. Um, so here we have the percentage of mothers that agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I feel like I belong in my community. 92% uh, of those with no ACEs said that compared to only 62% of those with four or more ACEs. Um, just what I wanted to underline, um, now that I've introduced those pilots, but before I hand over to, to Kerry to focus on the health visiting, is the ways in which, although they're in different settings, these pilots may be similar. Um, and the important thing for me is that, in neither case was it about a score derived from a list. Um, so in both scenarios, we're talking about a process by which a conversation is begun a tool that's provided that allows practitioners a way in, if you like, particularly in the GP setting where someone might be presenting with what they feel is a completely unrelated issue, this is an opportunity to start that discussion. A discussion that's not confined to 10 items on a scale, a wider discussion about that person's experiences and their current health and well-being. Um, in neither case is it about developing new care pathways. So when these services took part in the pilot, they didn't need any additional services to involve with them. They didn't need to understand any other referral pathways to the ones that they already had at their disposal. Instead, what it did was potentially allow them to use the resources that they already had in a more effective way by understanding some of the other root causes of people's health and wellbeing challenges. Um, and it wasn't to do with changing the practitioner role. So both pilots recognise that this is something that people already do. They may already understand this. They may already ask. It's all part and parcel of the roles that they had. 
but this is just a different way of collecting information on people's history from them. So there was no immediate threat to someone's professional identity in a particular role. This was part and parcel of the provisions that they already had and could provide. And on that, I shall pass over, and Kerry will talk to you about the, her experiences of kind of managing and delivering the, the process in Anglesey with the health visitors.